So first of all, I want to thank all of you for being here. It takes time, it takes effort to come down and find parking, but then everything becomes a little easier when the beer starts pouring, right? We have delicious beer provided by Greenwood Brewing, and we love this location. First of all, I want to say that this month is Women's History Month. Give it up for his Women's History Month. We love this location, but we love it even more this month uh, and supporting it because Greenwood is an all-women-owned brewery. And uh, before we get started, I want to introduce you to our host. Her name is Megan Greenwood. I want her to tell you about the place that you're standing in today and the idea of the Purposeful Pint. Megan, give it up for Megan. Thanks, Carlos. Hi, I'm Megan Greenwood. I'm the owner of Greenwood Brewing. This is almost as full as we have seen this beer garden, so this is beautiful to me. Um, we're going to get some more chairs, so if you want one, we'll get one for you. Uh, so we actually launched Greenwood. I launched Greenwood in 2017 as just a concept, but we actually opened our doors downtown in, in July of 2020. Um, if you can believe it, we did that. Uh, so we actually start, I started, I built the, the building that uh, all the magic happens right here where the, where the beer is made, um, and we renovated this building. But what we really wanted to create here was somewhere, one of our, our slogan is the power of the purposeful pint and having really great conversation over one of our favorite beverages, which is beer. Um, so I encourage you to have a great night tonight. Thanks so much for being here. Cheers. Thank you, Megan. Thanks so much, and thank you for being an amazing partner to Arizona Talks. Uh, tonight, not only are we celebrating Women's History Month, but we're also celebrating civil dialogue and open debate in Arizona. This is the whole point of this nonprofit, is to be able to have conversations that are tough, uh, conversations that we might not agree with, but we're having the conversation. Tonight, we will hear from seven different uh, voices. Uh, they will tell us their political story, who they are, what they do, and how they're shaping policy, news, business here in Arizona. Um, this nonprofit started from an idea, kind of like the conversations that we're having today around friends, around food, and around really tough subjects. We've been doing events for about three years, and today we're a growing nonprofit with an advisory board full of leaders across the political spectrum. So if you're on the advisory board, could you raise your hand? Let's give it up for the advisory board here. They're the ones that guide us, the ones that give us advice on what to talk about. Uh, just amazing. We also have a phenomenal staff that works together to create events like these and conversation projects like these. So if you're in the staff, could you raise your hand really quick? And let's thank them because they're the ones that have been putting this stuff together with us. Again, tonight we'll hear from seven guests. They'll talk about their political story for five to eight minutes each. So our whole program tonight will be about an hour. Feel free to get up, refill your beer. The restrooms are gonna be through this door. You can get through it at any point in this building. Um, we would love for you to get your phone out, take pictures, and definitely follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Arizona Talks. There's only one rule for tonight, and that is to stay civil. Um, that is what defines not only our mission, but what defines a lot of America. We live with people that are very different from one another. We disagree with them. We should be able to talk with them. Finally, I, wouldn't, I want to bring to our attention what is happening in Ukraine. It feels weird if we don't mention it tonight. We can only imagine what some of those people are going through, and I encourage you to reflect on how lucky we are he to be here with one another in this space. If you care about our system of government, if you care about philosophy and politics, if you care about our community, we need more spaces like this. We need spaces to discuss tough issues and respect uh, and promote openness. We invite you to take that responsibility on with us uh, and promote the tradition of civil dialogue and open debate. Please donate to Arizona Talks. If you got your ticket today, thank you so much. We are able to donate back at the registration table. I encourage every single one of you to become a member. This allows us to put events on like this. Your money goes directly to promoting conversation, doing events, and doing any kind of creative project our team comes up with. Uh, tonight, the interest for the speakers will be a bit short in the interest of time and to hear everybody's political story. So, to kick, every, uh, to kick this event off, please help me welcome all of the speakers. Just a big round of applause for the seven speakers that are about to come. All right, here we go. First up, I want to introduce Marcelino Quinones. He's, yeah, Marcelino. 
He's a new Arizona representative. He represents LD27, and he is a Democrat. Please help me welcome Marcelino Quinones. How's everybody doing? Uh, I didn't know I was going to get it started, so uh, that's wonderful. Thank you. I did tell everybody that I was going to stay to five minutes because I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, if I say something and you want to connect afterwards, let's make that happen. Let's keep the conversation going beyond tonight. Uh, give it up for our host. I am so happy to be here, especially the fact that it's an all-women-owned brewery. Give it up again for them. Uh, I'm excited to, uh, to share the stage with all of the speakers tonight, uh, but in particular uh, with the senator. Uh, thank you, Senator. I thought you've demonstrated a lot of courage and civility over the last year and a half, and so I think it's just important for us to recognize that. So thank you for, for that. All right, so uh, I just got started. Like, if I look at my watch, I can tell you when this happened. Um, I got appointed on December 15th at 9.45 in the morning. And then for the next two and a half hours, my phone did not stop ringing. It was just going off the charts. And at about noon, I realized that I had not spoken to my daughter, who didn't go to school that day. She had something else. And so I called her. And um, it went to voicemail, because that's what teenagers do to their dads when you call them. They don't pick up the phone. So it goes to voicemail, and I texted her, and I said, call me right now, period. So about 30 seconds later, my phone rang, and it's Mia. I was like, Mia, your daddy's now the state representative in District 27. And she's like, ah, oh. she goes like this. And then all of a sudden, she gets really serious, and she's like, Dad? I was like, yeah. She's like, if it's good news, you have to tell me that in a text message. You can't tell me to call you that right now. You know, you can't tell me to call you right now with the period. I share that because regardless of everything that goes on, the hype, the speculation, the media, the tweets, at the end of the day, it's about that, right? If I cannot fulfill my duty as a father to my daughter, then I'm not doing it right. And so um, she quickly humbled me. So uh, even though my phone had been going on for two and a half hours, um, she quickly said, chill, relax. Um, I ran for this position in 2014. And I came up a little short. And I share that with everybody here because a lot of times we sort of give up and we think that that's that. But um, I didn't give up. And then I learned another lesson. A lot of times you've got to do the work when nobody is watching. And you've got to do the work steady and steady and steady and steady and steady. And so that's what I did. When the, appointment didn't ha when, um, when the election didn't turn out exactly the way I expected it, that was okay. That was okay because my commitment and my service to the community was going to be ongoing. And so that's what I did. I worked for St. Vincent de Paul and we helped feed, clothe, house, and heal the needy. Uh, Arizona State University said, that guy kind of knows what he's doing. Let's, let's take him over there. So for the last three and a half years, I was able to serve as a director uh, to ensure that uh, we were creating the next generation of college students. What am I focused down there at the Capitol now? I'm focused on education. I'm focused on supporting our teachers. I'm focused on making sure that people have a house, that they have food on their, uh, on their tables, and, then, and that they live their lives uh, with integrity. All, I'm able to do that because of the things that I had been doing prior to the appointment. And so those are the lessons that I'm going to take with me. I'm going to tell you the last story. Um, when the appointment was sort of starting to become a reality, what you have to do is uh, you've got to get your PCs involved, your precinct committee members. You've got to call them, and you've got to tell them, hey, something's going on, and I need your help. And so I was doing my due diligence, and I was calling all of uh, my PCs. And uh, two days prior to the, the, the vote, the vote happened on December 1st, I called somebody, and I said, uh, may I speak to Cynthia, please? And then Cynthia says, yes, who's this? I said, oh, my name is Marcelino Quinones. I am trying to fulfill the... Uh, appointment process that, that, that you're a PC and you're voting on, on, uh, on Wednesday. She said, are you a real Democrat? I said, yes, I'm a real Democrat. And then I told her why I was a real Democrat. And uh, we kept the conversation going. And then I said to her, Cynthia, I need you on Wednesday to vote for me. Do, do you know how to vote on Wednesday? And she's like, where's the meeting at? And I said, what's your email address so I can send you the, the link and, and we can have you there? 
Okay, cool. So I show up on Wednesday to the Zoom meeting, and Cynthia's there. And then uh, I'm going to tell you a secret. Uh, you get nominated uh, to fill the position. I made a, a commitment, a promise to myself that if I didn't get nominated, I wasn't going to go for it. I was just going to keep doing the wonderful work that I was doing at the university. That's, I said that to myself. I said, if I don't get nominated, I'm going to keep doing my work. So about five or six people get nominated, and then seven and eight. And then I, I didn't start shaking, but my, my toes were kind of going like, okay, what's going to happen? And then out of the blue, uh, she, uh, Cynthia says, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, uh, I'd like to nominate Mar Marcelino Canones. Uh, and then the rest is history, and now I'm standing before you. So um, if there's anything I can do, let me know. Thank you all for being here, for uh, being good civic participants. Let's keep the conversation going after tonight, and uh, go Arizona. And by the way, if you have questions, comments, uh, we encourage people to continue to stay here. We're going to be here. The speakers will stick around. Feel free and come say hello. Next, I want to introduce Chuck Coughlin. He is the president and CEO of High Ground Incorporated. If you've been in politics for a while, uh, at the legislature, within elections, you've probably heard his name before. Please help me welcome Chuck Coughlin. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Well, you know, I'm moved by that story because, you know, that's how life happens. It happens to you when you're least expecting it and you have to be prepared. And like he, he, the funny story there was he's talking about how he had to call precinct committeemen because every appointment, may, maybe a lot of people don't know this, when the Board of Supervisors have to appoint somebody, it's up to the precinct committeemen of the party that that member leaves. So they give the County Board of Supervisors a list. And so he made it through that vetting process. And so it's a process. So I don't want to bore you tonight. I don't think I will. But I'm going to talk a little bit about that process in terms of how Medicaid restoration happened in 2013. So that was the process by which uh, we expanded Medicaid coverage in Arizona to cover at the end of the day, about 63,000 individuals more than was under the program then, but literally about 200,000 that had been frozen out of the program. So set the stage. Um, Jan was governor. I ran all of Jan's campaigns, uh, so don't throw things at me. Um, so, and probably won't throw things after me afterward, but, um, you know, it was difficult. That was the recession, the Great Recession, three billion dollar deficit and Andy Biggs was president of the state senate by 2013 when this thing rolled around. He's now the chairman of the Freedom Caucus, if many of you don't know, in the U.S. Congress. Um, uh, Andy and uh, our Speaker of the House was um, the former uh, the Kirk Adams, who is now was Governor Ducey's chief of staff. After the 14 elections, we're rolling into this. Republicans had a two, or no, after the 10 elections, Republicans had two thirds majorities in both bodies. So they used to call the Democratic caucus the pizza caucus because it used one pizza to feed everybody. It wasn't a lot of Democrats down there. It was a veto proof majority legislature. And what we were trying to do was a improve, uh, get a Medicaid restoration plan established or expansion established. And so we started with some polling. And the polling uh, showed that 9% of Arizona Republicans supported Medicaid, supported the Affordable Care Act. That's a problem because you have a Republican governor. So background, 2000, uh, in 2000, Voters in Arizona had passed the uh, Prop 204, which required the state with a tobacco tax to cover um, all, of, all, of the, all of the people in Arizona that were 100% of the federal poverty level for Medicaid. That was funded with tobacco tax. Well, tobacco tax is not a thing that continues to fund because more, less and less people are doing that, but that's how it was funded. 
So back to the Great Recession, we have a $3 billion deficit. We had to freeze Medicaid coverage. So in the process of that, between at the beginning about 09 and 10, about 200,000 people lost their Medicaid coverage. So they're off Medicaid, because the state literally couldn't afford it. We were broke. I mean, literally could not have met payroll in 09. Jan got a property or a sales tax approved in 10. I'm not gonna go into that. So during the recession, we froze those Medicaid benefits. Normally you couldn't do that because 204 was voter protected, which says you can't affect the outcome of a ballot proposition. But the court knew that tobacco taxes weren't funding the full expansion and you needed general fund revenues to do that. So what we knew once the economy started to recover, we'd be forced to recover, we'd, we'd put all those people back on the Medicaid rolls. So the court couldn't order us to fund it. We knew that. December of 13 rolls around, December 12 rolls around, and the Obama administration comes out with a uh, policy on the Affordable Care Act. It says if you cover up to 138% of the federal poverty level, you will get 90% coverage of everything. Well, that's a math problem, right? I mean, why not do that? I mean, that's an easy math problem. That's not the way things happen down in the state legislature. It's, it's a, you know, go back to the fact that 9% of Republicans in Arizona supported the Affordable Care Act. So we started a campaign. We started talking about how to restore Medicaid coverage to those people who had it. And we began an effort to educate people about that. So we did a lot of polling. And this was a long campaign. Um, back to, there's a lot of things that Marcel say that happened behind the scenes. So we found four talking points that really worked. Arizona's not the problem. Access is an incredible agency. It's a, we were the last state to join Medicaid. And it's a partnership with all the healthcare providers here in Arizona. And we knew we could emphasize that, particularly with Republicans. There was a hidden healthcare tax. So if you don't have healthcare and you show up at the emergency room, they have to provide healthcare for you. It's not an if and or but, it is you have to provide it. Reams of people were showing up in the recession and more and more people were having to get coverage, which we call uncompensated care. Well, that ends up in, in any taxpayer's pocket because insurers then reflect that in the uncompensated care in a tax, which ends up in your policy because they can't do it for free. So we had to, do, we had to stop that. We must stop growing on uncompensated care because we were compromising the very industry that was gonna provide care for everybody else. This is really relevant when the pandemic came around because you're like, oh, we actually have a healthcare industry in Arizona that's in a good position so they could afford the ability to react to a crisis. We tested all these messages. I'm not gonna go through the data with you, but all of them were very positive messages with Republicans overwhelmingly, and you may say that, well, why just, I knew they were gonna be popular with Democrats, but remember the audience that we're working with. We're working with overwhelming numbers of Republicans in the legislature. And then we went back to respect to the will of the voters. So 2004, they'd passed it. We had a Voter Protection Act. And we said, it's the will of the voters. This is what we should do. So Governor Brewer wasn't, was super leery. <laughs> Uh, we got down to the point where we were practicing the state of the state speech on the House floor and she'd removed it from the speech and I'm on the floor and you know I'd, I had talked to her about this in fact we had written an editorial because uh, nobody in the industry wanted to get ahead of the governor because they knew the governor was going to be the pinpoint on which everybody else would revolve and so I remember this sort of amusing story we the industry had written an editorial, which I largely helped write, and um, Betsy Bayless, who's the CEO of Valleywise at the time, or MIHS then at the time, good friend, and 
we submitted it to her and we said, hey, this is what we're going to put in the paper. And she's like, oh, no, 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 no. You can't put that in the paper. So I said, well, let's edit it. Let's edit it with your team. So we're literally on a car ride on the way home in the car. I have her staff on the call. On the call. This is, and I said, well, let's go through it. So we went through it. And she made all these edits to it on the way through. So I said at the end of the call, I'm sitting in my garage at home. I said at the end of the call, I said, so you agree with this editorial? She goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> So the art of lobbying <laughs> is getting somebody to agree to something that they really don't, haven't really committed to yet. So then we're on the floor of the Senate and she takes it out of the speech. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I remember it was NFL playoff times and I just got up out of my chair and I walked out of the, uh, off the floor and she goes, you're not going anywhere. And I go, well, we're not doing what we need to do. And she said, sit down. And I'm like, okay. So I sat down. And so she put it back obviously in the speech. And we had an amazing public affairs campaign back to work, serious hard work, 75 public opinion pieces, 200 letters to the editor, dozens of statewide editorial board meeting, two letters to Republican precinct committeemen, because she knows that's her base of support. Um, I have them here today quoting, quoting from them. And then the special session came around. We actually called a special session because obviously Mr. Biggs wasn't going to give up the floor, wasn't going to let it happen. So the only way it was to bulldoze our way onto the floor with a group of Republicans, a majority of his caucus, who would agree. And she husbanded those votes, cultivated those votes, relationship those votes so carefully, it was unbelievable. She had him in her office. She talked to him every day. We made a decision when we were going to call, get, the, get it done. There was a procedural way to get the bill to the floor, but it involved rolling the president. Not great, because that's full-on conflict. So we talked about the debate on the floor, when the debate would take place on the floor. And it was going to be brutal, because all of those Republicans who were supportive of it were going to be attacked by all their colleagues, relentlessly attacked by all their colleagues. And we said, don't respond. Don't do anything. Sit there. Do not engage them. When you get up to explain your vote at the end of the day, which senators can do and representatives can do, they can explain their vote. But in committee of the whole, when you're debating the bill, they want to draw you out. They want to draw you out into debate. Don't let them. Because your talking point is not their talking point. And you have the floor. We've already got the floor. So a majority of the Republican caucus sat there and was beat upon relentlessly by their colleagues. And they sat there and they took it. Closed the debate, moved the bill, got to third read, passed the bill. Then they tried to refer it. <laughs> so then we got into another debate about with the industry about how, or with the political culture about how to refer it. So, and I've been doing this, I don't know, 35, 40 years now. And what I would say, you know, I'd, I'd quote, uh, Paul will appreciate that, I'd quote Ecclesiastes at the end, you know, anger resides in the lap of fools. Do not allow yourself to become angry. There's always a path. There's always a path if you're surrounded with people who are smart and figure out a way to get what you want done. And that is why I'm here today. So thanks. Thank you so much, Chuck. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, next up, I want to introduce a longtime friend and advocate. She is a former journalist, and she's the candidate right now, a candidate for Arizona State Representative. She doesn't ride a bike. Maybe she does. Uh, she is running to be a can she's a candidate right now for the Arizona State to be an Arizona State Representative of LD24. Please help me welcome. Annalise Ortiz. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Arizona Talks, for having me today. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Like Carlos said, my name is Annalise Ortiz. I'm running for the Arizona House of Representatives in LD24. I'm a civil rights activist and a born and raised Arizonan. And I want to talk today about growing up brown in Arizona. The first time I ever experienced any kind of racism or prejudice or discrimination, I was only about four years old. And my mom had taken me to a prayer group of all places. And all the little kids were playing together outside. 
And at one point, I had gone inside, probably to get a drink of water or something. And when I came back out, I heard one of the older girls we were playing with, we'll call her Karen, say, oh no, here comes that little brown girl again. And at this time, I didn't really know or think about the fact that I was brown, but she said it with such disgust in her voice that I knew something was wrong. So I went back into the house and I sat by my mom's feet for the rest of the day. And one of the older ladies there knew something was wrong, so she gave me a rainbow-colored stuffed animal octopus to make me feel better. And I took that stuffed animal home, but every time I looked at that octopus, I got a pit in my stomach. I felt the same shame and embarrassment and confusion that I had felt on that day. I grew up with five siblings. One of them is here today. <laughs> and uh, Gabe can tell you that we were wild kids. We were always running around outside with no shoes on in the desert uh, with our hair a mess. And one day after I'd been playing outside, I came back in and our oldest brother, Joaquin, he said, look how dirty your feet are. And he grabbed a washcloth and he started washing my foot. And this sounds gross, but I watched the color change from a dark brown to a lighter brown. And that night I sat in the shower scrubbing my face, hoping to make it lighter. And then when I was 10, something really weird happened. I got a white spot on my eyelid and the white spot started to grow and grow. So my mom took me to the dermatologist and the dermatologist told us that my immune system was attacking the melanin in my skin. I had a condition called vitiligo. And I remember being just 10 years old, so scared thinking that God must have been playing some kind of joke on me for not loving my brown skin enough. As you can imagine, it took some time to unlearn that kind of internalized insecurity. And part of what helped me overcome that was becoming an auntie to five beautiful brown girls. And I'm watching them grow up in their Arizona public schools. And I'm watching this debate that's going on right now in our country and in our state about a problem that doesn't exist, a problem that has been created to really divide us. It's this term called critical race theory, something that isn't taught and hasn't been taught in any K through 12 school. And I think about this phrase and the way it's being used to fear monger and divide us. And I am thinking about how important it is for young kids to be learning that racism and oppression does indeed exist in this country and that it should not be tolerated, but that we cannot dismantle it without talking about it. And what people really want, I know what I really want for my nieces and for other kids in schools, is to be, for them to be learning about Dolores Huerta, who with her brown skin led one of the most historic labor strikes to fight labor exploitation of farm workers. What we want is for young kids to be learning about the indigenous peoples who created the intricate canal systems that make Arizona livable today. What we want is for all kids to be learning about Sojourner Truth, who had the courage to say that the women's suffrage movement could not only be about white women's right to vote. What we want is for all kids to learn about people who look like them, and not just during Black History Month or Hispanic Heritage Month, but every single day. But unfortunately, there are adults in the room who are not being adults. There are adults in the room who are scared of white kids in particular, learning about the honest truth of history and of the ugly racism and violence and oppression that exists in our nation's history. I think that they're scared that that little Annalise that day would have treated Karen the same way that Karen treated her. And they're scared that Karen might feel uncomfortable learning about this stuff. But never mind all of the kids of color who are dealing with this kind of hurt and pain and trauma just because of the color of their skin every day. 
And my question is how can we ever expect our students to make sure that they grow up and not let history repeat itself if they don't learn that history in the first place? My question is when has this nation ever solved any problem by pretending it doesn't exist? That day at the prayer group, there was an adult in the room who tried to make me feel better. She knew something was wrong. She knew she had an opportunity to change it. She didn't know about the hurtful words, but she had a gesture of kindness. And so we have an opportunity right now to be adults in the room. We can fight against the bills being introduced at our state legislature that aim to ban books and ban history and censor history. We can stand up and refuse to vote for politicians who are using our kids as political ploys. We can make sure that we are having these uncomfortable conversations at our kitchen tables with our friends and family who have heard this phrase critical race theory on the news but don't know the truth of it. And we can make sure that all kids have safe spaces in their public schools, whether they are students of color or LGBTQ plus students who are also being attacked by our state legislature right now. My name is Annalise Ortiz and I'm running for the Arizona House of Representatives. And I believe that that little brown girl with her rainbow colored octopus would be pretty proud of how far she's come. Thank you so much. Thank you, Annalise. Thank you, Annalise. Next, I want to go with the Charles J. Merriam, distinguished professor of the Sandra Day O'Connor School College of Law. She's been a speaker before for us on immigration and other topics. I want to please, please help me welcome Angela Banks. So good evening, everyone. Thank you, Carlos, and thank you, Arizona Talks, for including me in this event tonight. Uh, so I definitely feel like I'm the odd woman out. I am somebody who has not involved in Arizona politics, so I want to talk a bit about my, po <laughs> about my political journey and sort of my political views and how I ended up where I am. So not only am I a professor at the law school, but um, my area of expertise is immigration. And I look at that from a perspective about membership and belonging in democratic societies. And so how did I become interested in caring about education and thinking about how we conceptualize membership and belonging in a democratic society. Well, a lot of it stems from my father's story. So I grew up in Seattle, Washington. I'm a child of the 80s. Um, Valley Girl Talk and all the rest. But my dad grew up in the Arkansas Delta during the heart of Jim Crow. And I grew up hearing stories about his life there and one of them just always stayed with me. So my dad uh, recently retired as a professor of education at the University of Washington. Um, but growing up, he couldn't attend the local library. He, uh, the Arkansas Delta where he grew up was a rural agricultural community. Uh, my father's family owned a, a cotton farm. Um, but he was not allowed to go to the library because of the Jim Crow segregation rules at the time. But my dad loved to read. He, uh, even in high school, he was a substitute teacher for the elementary school when the teachers were out. Like, the, he was born to be a teacher and loved reading and loved learning. But he wasn't allowed to go to the library, so what did he do? He sold garden seeds. He would go farm to farm and sell garden seeds to everybody they knew so that he could earn enough money to buy books. Because even though uh, he wasn't going to be able to get the free books, he knew that he would get books one way or another. He then went on to go to college. And one of the interesting things is the reason he ended up specializing in education and becoming, uh, he started as a fifth grade teacher, was because Chicago Teachers College uh, was free. Um, and so when he arrived in Chicago, because his brothers lived there, he figured, well, I'll work the first summer, save enough money to be able to enroll in school in the fall. Well, it took him a little longer to get a job and save enough money, but he was eventually able to go to Chicago Teachers College and then on and get his doctorate, et cetera. But that story was really inspiring to me and remains inspiring to me because it reminds me about the potential that exists throughout our society. There's so many kids in so many spaces that are incredibly bright and have the the sort of insight and the, if they have the right opportunity can truly change our world and solve the most pressing problems that our society is facing. And opportunity is really what they need. And so I grew up thinking about this. It's shaped sort of my political ideas and the things that I decided to commit myself to. Uh, and when I was living, so I graduated from college, went to law school, 
was working in the Netherlands for an international tribunal at a time when immigration was a really tough topic in, in Europe. Um, I had moved there right at the time that a Dutch politician had been assassinated. And the idea that had been circulating within the sort of public discourse was that he had been killed by an immigrant because his um, political party had been pushing a lot of rhetoric about the harm that immigrants were creating within the Netherlands. Turns out he was assassinated by a Dutch environmentalist beside the point, but it got me interested in thinking about immigration and immigrants and uh, incorporation within democratic societies. And so when I came back to the States, that's really where I focused my work. Um, and so I spent 10 years as a professor in Virginia, uh, public university, moved to Arizona to another public university, and that has really been important to me because one of the things that I think is incredibly important is the role that our public universities play in our society. They really are a sort of a gateway of opportunity for people. There is nothing more moving to me than going to graduation. When you see the families of the individuals who are graduating, some of them are the first in their family to graduate from college, many are the first in their family to become lawyers, and the joy and the exuberance that you you see in the cheering and the clapping and the and the hugs and the just excitement is because they recognize the true opportunity that their loved one now has. Um, and being at a public institution with affordable tuition, et cetera, um, really makes that opportunity available. And so that is one reason why I enjoy being an academic, uh, enjoy being a professor because of the teaching role that I get to play, but also the research that I do thinking about how can we ensure that our society continues to be a place where all students have an opportunity to succeed, where all students are going to have that opportunity to flourish, to read books, <laughs> to learn about the world around them, and think about what kind of contribution they can make to the world around them. So thank you for your time tonight, and I will end there. That was amazing. Thank, you. thank you, Angela. Next, I want to uh, bring up uh, Senator Paul Boyer. He's an Arizona State Senator for LD20. Please help me welcome Arizona Senator Paul Boyer. Good evening. My uh, interest in politics began about 20 years ago due to a country that's about 6,000 miles away that's been around for several thousand years that's probably had more invasions than any other country that I know of. In March of 2002, uh, there was a suicide bombing in Israel. It's now known as the Seder bombing. That's where there were mostly uh, elderly Jews, about 100, that were celebrating Passover. And the bomber comes in, blows himself up, and murders about 30 elderly Jews. I'm, I'm Christian. I'm not even Jewish. But that was kind of my aha moment, if you will, where I never in a million years <laughs> thought I was going to be involved in politics. I thought I was going to be a journalist or a pastor. I was the editor-in-chief at ASU West at the student newspaper. And the bombing happened. And it, I almost fell out of my chair. I, I just couldn't fathom why someone would want to do that. And so I just decided right then and there that I was going to learn everything I could about that issue. Being an English major, I printed every official state document from 1917 to 2002, <laughs> and I read all of them. <laughs> because I knew enough to know that everyone had their own thoughts on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and I didn't want any spin. I just wanted to know, okay, what was really going on? And through that, I got invited to Shabbat dinner uh, every Friday night at the Tempe campus. We called it the main campus at the time. And I was the, I guess, the token Christian, if you will. And, but we always talked about politics afterwards. And I stuck around, and then I found out about this trip to Israel. And I thought, oh, well, you probably have to be Jewish, and it's probably expensive, and I was broke. So, but then I heard the rabbi talking to you know, all the students at ASU, and hey, do you want to go on this trip? And finally, I, I got up the nerve, and I called Rabbi Lee, Barton Lee at the time, and I said, hey, I really want to go on this trip. I'll write anybody, I'll call anybody, I'll meet with anybody, I'll write essays, I'll do whatever it takes. He says, Paul, I'll call you back. He calls me an hour later, says, you leave in a week. And so I, I got to spend about a month in Israel. Uh, through that time, I, I met my then future boss, I didn't know that at the time, a, a guy at APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Uh, so I worked in DC for, uh, for about a year, and then I, 
I missed home a little bit and, and came back. And I've always needed a job, and there was always some kind of political job. And so <laughs> I ended up becoming the legislative liaison for the Department of Corrections here in Arizona. For about three years, I got fired. My then boss said, hey, I want you to record every conversation that you have with legislators. And I thought, A, that's unethical. And B, I said, do you want me to get legislation passed, or do you want me to tell you what I talked about? Because you can't have both. And then, I, I kid you not, she says to me, I, was, I got invited to happy hour by then um, Representative Bob Stump, just because he liked me. And there were going to be about five members there, and he says, uh, yeah, you know, why don't you come hang out with us? And I'm on my way out, and the deputy director, she says, where are you going? I tell her, and she says, unless you can justify in writing why this would benefit the department, you can't go. And I could have handled it differently. <laughs> I, I looked at her and I said, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't, it, I was not gainfully employed there for, for much longer. Then three months, uh, Kirk Adams picked me up. I did communications for the house. And I was so grateful because if you remember, that was the height of the, the fiscal crisis, the, the, the housing market crashed, and it was the worst time to be unemployed. I was unemployed. I was watching uh, Invincible, the movie, the true story about Vince Papali every single morning to give me some motivation in filling out my job applications. It's the reason why I'm an Eagles fan today, to this day. And, and Kirk hired me, thankfully. And so I, for three years, I was on staff, and I thought I knew a, a little bit, at least, about public policy. You know, I was getting uh, maybe an inch deep in you know, education, healthcare, uh, maybe public safety, the three main buckets that, w that we spend a lot on at the state legislature. And then, 10 years ago, redistricting. Never thought I'd run for office. Two out of my three state legislators both decided to retire, Linda Gray and Jim Wires. That never happens. I mean, there's two open seats. And so I thought, eh, why not? I've sold books door to door, door to door in South Carolina, and I'm used to getting rejected, so it can't be that much harder. I interned for my congressman, John Shattig, and so I'm used to knocking on doors for him, and so I knocked on a lot of doors that year and uh, made a lot of phone calls and for whatever reason became the top boat getter and here I am 10 years later. And so, but what my colleagues don't get about me and what they don't understand is as far as what, what shaped me, you know, kind of like what I, how, how I make decisions, you know, the state legislature, how I, um, you know, my thought process. And for me, you have to go back about 2,500 years. Now, Chuck's going to bust my chops for, for bringing this up. But there, there's a quote that I can't get rid of for some reason. It's, in, it's from the Apology by Plato. And Socrates, who's on trial uh, for corrupting the youth and believing in different gods and other trumped-up charges, and he says, for anyone who wants to pursue justice must live a private and not a public life if they're going to survive for even a short time. Now, I don't know about you, but that, it haunts me. It really does. And I wonder if he's right. And then there's another line that I can't get, get rid of, and that's, he says, death is not something I could, I, I could care less about, but the one thing I do care about is that I commit no act of injustice. And so, for those of you who know me, I'm, I'm a busy guy. I, I teach part-time at PVCC. I have a three-year-old. He keeps me really busy. And it's been hard to get you know, meetings with me some, day, some of these days. So um, a pro tip, if you want to get a meeting with me, just say you want to talk about Socrates <laughs> or Cicero. <laughs> then you're, you're guaranteed to get a meeting. And so then there's, then there's Cicero. He's another guy that, that I look to. And at the time when Cicero... Uh, what was around the first century BC, there were three, three main schools of thought. There's Epicureanism, Stoicism, and Platonism. And there's this curious line that he writes to his son. It's the last text that, the last text that we have, the last, it's really a book, but it's a, a letter he wrote to his son. It's called On Duties. And he says that we all would like to be Socratic. We all, in other words, I, I think he's leaning towards Platonism, but what, so well, I'm sorry, what Cicero did is he, he took those three schools of thought didn't really find himself in one of them, but he, he, he chewed the fruit and spit the, out the seeds, if you will. He took the best of all three and tried to, to find what was best and, and, and live his life that way. And, and I really think if he hadn't been assassinated, he would have been, been one of the best philosophers the, the world has ever seen. That's my opinion. I could be way off on that. 
uh, notwithstanding Plato. And so I, I like to do the same. I mean, the Wall Street Journal is one of my favorites. Uh, National Review, I've even come to, to love Ben Shapiro. Uh, but I also read everything on the other side. I mean, I read, I read The Nation, I'll read you know, everything that's out there because I'm looking for good arguments. And so there, there's, there's one uh, legislator who doesn't have to knock. He can just walk in my office, and that's my good friend, Sean Bowie. <laughs> you know, he's a Democrat, I'm a Republican, but we talk. We, we do a lot of this. And, you know, sadly, we can't have discussion uh, given the, the venue, but we do. We, we enjoy uh, just talking and hashing through policy. We don't always agree, but we really enjoy just, okay, what do you think about this? Have you thought about this? I'm like, oh, no, I hadn't thought about that. And so um, I, I just think we need more of that. Uh, I am taking a political Sabbath uh, after 10 years. Uh, it's just, it's time. Uh, my wife and I want to have more kids and just want to get to know my son a little bit better than this crazy schedule here at the legislature. I do hope though, moving forward, that I'm a little concerned and, and I, I might sound critical of my party only because it's my party and I, I do love it, but I am concerned about a, a populist strain that seems to be permeating my party, uh, the normalization of deficit spending, I really am worried about that. I remember 10 years ago, uh, the Tea Party movement started because of the stimulus. It was $1 billion. Now it's like $1 billion, whatever, we'll just throw another few billion on and no big deal. And just, it seems like both parties are now normalizing deficit spending, and that's a worry to me. And so I hope that's not where we're heading. Uh, I hope that we can get other elected officials that that care about uh, tackling debt like we did last year here in, in Arizona. Hopefully we can do more of that. And that's my story. Thank you. How's everybody doing out there? Good? Got enough beer in the glass? I just got mine refilled. We have two more speakers for you tonight. And uh, the next speaker I want to introduce is the executive director of the Arizona Republic. His name is Greg Burton. We got a chance to meet at a prior event happening here, and I thought, why not give this guy an invitation to come and tell his story? So please, help me welcome Greg Burton. So I won't be as polished as everybody else. I'm not running for office or leaving office. So if you'll indulge me. I'm, I'm also wearing a belt for the first time in a while instead of stretchy pants. So um, I'm delighted to be here. I come here a lot, you know, because I live close by. It's a great business. I love to support local businesses. And I love the fact that a local business cares about its community enough to put on something like this. So it's just a fabulous event. And I'm glad you are all here tonight. So I'm not on broadcast, so I write a lot, so I'm just gonna read. I'll try to look up and down. Excuse my readers. <laughs> so when I was young, I wanted to be a poet because I loved words. When I got older, I wanted to be a journalist because I loved words that made a difference in a community, that had the power to change the course of history. I may be the executive editor of the Arizona Republic, but I'm really that poet who became an investigative reporter. Here's why. The best journalism about policy and government and civics and justice and life is journalism that tells you something that the powerful don't want you to know. Let me say that again. The most important journalism tells you something that the powerful don't want you to know. It empowers you. It's the old adage, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, right? And the comfortable, just FYI, are most of your speakers tonight, maybe some of you and me. Journalism that serves the community challenges the powerful to act in the best interest of the public. So my motivation is to tell you what the powerful don't want you to know. There's a powerful right there trying to, trying to shut me down. 
That motivation led a team of journalists at the Republic to file a series of requests for public records from the Arizona Senate and its audit subcontractor, Cyber Ninjas. That motivation led the Republic to file a lawsuit against the Senate, sorry, Bob, Paul, and Cyber Ninjas for failing to turn over tens of thousands of records about the vote in Maricopa County. That's the motivation to empower you to act. It's the kind of journalism that lends itself to nights like this talking about civics, engaging with each other, challenging each other to find solutions to our problems. It doesn't help anyone if I just sit in my office and report that one side says this and the other side says that. Let me give you an example. The evidence of human-caused warming of the Earth has been overwhelming for decades, and yet only recently did these stories start to appear regularly on the evening news without relying on he said, she said tropes. Many politicians and policymakers ignored the overwhelming scientific truth about climate change until catastrophic wildfires and floods destroyed any doubt. It's better for all of us if journalists shine a light on what can't be seen and expose leaders who deny the truth. Here's why that matters with the audit. Our reporting from public records and deep sourcing highlighted the fact that Republicans there in Arizona stood up to other Republicans. Maricopa County Supervisors, House Speaker Rusty Bowers, State Senator Paul Boyer, they had the courage to thwart the theft of our votes. They listened to the public, which is all of us. Fealty to a person in power is destructive to democracy. F successful leaders embrace a diversity of perspectives. Successful civic dialogue, like democracy, requires openness and transparency. It feeds on the truth. It requires the amplification of the voiceless. That's my job. Serving the, the community re requires, serving the, serving the community requires me to listen and to encourage you to listen to each other. This isn't magical thinking but it's never been important, more important than right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Greg. Finally, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce Kathy Connect. She's an advisory board member. You want, you want that? Yeah. We'll set it up for you. Uh, she is the um, advisory board member at Voter Choice Arizona. Uh, she, this is her third time speaking at an Arizona Talks event. So this is fantastic. We want to thank you for doing that. And as we get the mic ready here, please help me welcome Kathy Connect. Woohoo! Thank you, gentlemen. Yes, I wrote my notes down too on paper. <laughs> Uh, so back in the day, well, uh, I've come to that time in my life when I start my commentary with back in the day, and then I have to put my readers on. So, But I think it's really important for people, especially the younger generations, to know that politics hasn't always been the way that we're experiencing it now. Or maybe the politics was the same, but what's different is that it used to be contained. It used to be contained to certain times or among certain groups of people in certain situations. You can blame the media or social media or dark money or Citizens United, but the fact is that politics now is a much noisier, ever-present and more toxic element of our lives than it's ever been before. 
My first political memory is from 1972. I was five years old. I was sitting in the back seat of the car, and it was dark outside. And my mom and my dad were leaning in and listening intensely and intently to a newscast about Watergate. All I understood was that something ugly and important was going on, and that they were very disturbed, and that I was supposed to be quiet in the back seat. But aside from that, politics were never, ever at the forefront of my very average, middle-class, suburban Phoenix upbringing. I don't remember my parents ever arguing among themselves or with others over politics. Our neighborhood was very cohesive and very social. And granted, we were largely a homogeneous group, and I was just a little kid. But I was certainly never aware of party differences among my neighbor, although I know now that they were, in fact, different. But still, everyone on Hayward Avenue in North Phoenix watched out for each other's kids. We worked on each other's neighborhood uh, yard projects. We went to each other's barbecues. And we never, ever questioned each other's patriotism. The families all wanted the kids to be healthy and safe. Uh, and, to, and they all wanted to, us to do well in our beloved neighborhood school, which, by the way, we all went to. They wanted to have work and be successful. And we all caravaned down to Rocky Point together in campers. My folks were lifelong Republicans, but they weren't die hard. My dad used to tell the story of driving from Iowa to New Mexico on the day that John F. Kennedy made his inaugural address. My dad was so inspired that he pulled off the road so that he could ensure that he heard every single word when the Democrat, Kennedy, challenged all Americans to ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. Later in life, Fox News changed my dad. But that's a story for another day. Now, back in my day, my parents and their friends didn't wear t-shirts that advertised their political tribe. They didn't don Gerald Ford baseball caps. And they sure as heck didn't have bumper stickers on their car that said, F Jimmy Carter. Back in my day, we truly observed that now elusive respect for the office and I remember distinctly cleaning my house and thinking in my head, we have to make it so clean that the president could visit. In the early 90s, I was a school teacher here in Arizona for one year and then for four years in Illinois. When my husband Tom and I came back to Arizona to start our family, we decided to register as independents because I never really believed that party was important anyway. And I was already very disillusioned with the lack of support that the majority party was showing to public schools in Arizona. So for 24 years, I was a nonpartisan independent voter. I voted for the issues that I cared about, primarily education, for the candidates who agreed with my point of view. I ran for a nonpartisan seat on a nonpartisan school board, and I sell, served well for 12 years with colleagues who also served in a nonpartisan way. But each successive year, there were more blatant, aggressive partisans infiltrating school boards, getting elected by using partisan tactics and partisan messaging, and making the work much more difficult and much less pleasant. And while school boards are still officially nonpartisan, the contamination of part partisan politics has robbed us all of our right to have earnest public servants deliver authentic, unbiased service to kids and teachers in our community, maybe forever. In 2017, I earned my master's degree in interdisciplinary studies. My capstone project focused, of course, on politics and education. My research affirmed a previous study concluding that even in nonpartisan school board races, voters sought out and responded to partisan cues to select the board candidates that they wanted to vote for. In other words, it's all about the party, stupid. So naturally, in 2018, 
I launched a state senate campaign as an independent. It was a two-way race, and I, it was impressively close, but I lost. Chuck Coughlin tried to warn me. <laughs> then in 2020, I was persuaded to run for the state house as a partisan candidate and not in the majority party. I had incredible help and raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's just the dollars we knew about. Even though it was COVID time, we ran an extraordinary campaign, and I still contend that I was the better candidate. But even with a single shot strategy, I lost again to the two candidates who had the registration advantage. Now I'm working for an electoral system in which more matters than just the candidate's political party. How can we not see that if we act on the delusion that only party matters, then we are accepting that nothing else does. Not honesty, not experience, not integrity, not intelligence, not compassion, not ability. And as we keep increasingly paying attention to and only responding to these partisan triggers, we get fewer leaders with those very qualities that we desperately need to overcome the extreme challenges that we're facing today. I believe that ranked choice voting offers hope for better outcomes. And now I'm putting my time and energy into teaching people how and why. In short, candidates would have to find more common ground if they had to appeal to their opponent's supporters to be those supporters' second and third ranked choices. We might have more civil debate and less extreme re representation. We'd have more diverse candidates, ideologically and otherwise, who could compete without feeling that they'd split the vote and spoil the election for some viable ally. Voter Choice Arizona wants to tell you more about that, so see me and my friends later. But for now, my friends, we're being played. We're being played by the people who peddle panic and power, and they delight in how easily we are divided and eventually and inevitably conquered. They push our buttons using the all-powerful media and unlimited amounts of money, and it works. And it works, and it works, and they'll keep on doing it as long as it works and as long as we let it work, it will work until it doesn't. And when and if that happens is completely up to us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Um, at this point, we're done. These are all the speakers that are here. So please give it up for the speakers, the staff, the advisory board. Greenwood Brewing, and all of you.